Hi everybody, welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. My name is Jared. In this video, we're going to talk about angels because that's one thing that stood out to me during this general conference is uh, they brought up a number of times angels and angels having charge over you when you go to the temple. And I just felt like there was a, a lot. So what I did, uh, I went to my uh, spreadsheet called Timeline Phrases, High Frequency Terms, and I already had angels on there, but I added angel singular. So I have both singular and plural. And I did the tally of how many general conference talks uh, these words show up in. And I was surprised that for 2024, I mean, we still have another general conference to go. I do this by the year, not by general conference. Uh, it wasn't as much as I thought. And so uh, that was a little confusing. But what was said, I think, is really interesting. So let me show you the talks and what they said. And then we're going to also look at review some other things that we've read before on the channel about appearances. Appearances from Joseph Smith, Hiram Smith, the Savior, God the Father, to, to people, to congregations, to people, and, and you may not know it. I'll, I'll show you what I mean in just a minute here. And then there was one particular scripture uh, that has been quoted quite a bit within recent years that has to do with this. I'll show you that as well. Okay, so first we're going to start with President Holland's talk, Motions of a Hidden Fire. And uh, he talked about angels. So this was part of how the general conference started was him talking about angels. I want to start from right here, though. He says, against the backdrop of Christ's victory over death and his recent gift to me of a few more weeks or months in mortality, which is still stunning for me to think, I bear solemn witness of the reality of eternal life and the need for us to become serious in our planning for it. I bear witness that when he comes, meaning the second coming, he needs to recognize us not as nominal members listed on a faded baptismal record, but as thoroughly committed, faithfully believing, covenant-keeping disciples. That is a big warning. And then he continues, This is an urgent matter for all of us, lest we ever hear the devast with devastating regret. I never knew you. Or, as Joseph Smith translated that phrase, you never knew me. Fortunately, now look at this. After like all that warning, talking about the, the both death and the second coming and needing to be serious and urgent and not nominal members of the church, then he says, fortunately, we have help for this task. Lots of help. We need to believe in angels. That's the first thing, like when he's talking about help. The first thing he mentions is angels. We need to believe in angels and miracles and the promises of the Holy Priesthood. We need to believe in the gift of the Holy Ghost, the influence of good families and friends, in the power of the pure love of Christ. We need to believe in revelation and prophets, seers and revelators and President Russell M. Nelson. We need to believe that with prayer and pleading and personal righteousness, we really can ascend to Mount Z quote. Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly place, the holiest of all. And that's a quote, or that comes from DNC section 76, verse 66. And we've already covered this in a video, but I just want to remind you that after that verse, it talks, these are they who have come to an innumerable company of angels, to the, gen to the general assembly and church of Enoch and of the firstborn, we know that one of the events that's going to take place uh, <coughs> excuse me, during uh, the second coming, the process of the second coming, is joining again with the city of Enoch. And I would also suppose the city of Melchizedek and all the righteous saints that have been resurrected. And um, I th the way that I picture it is that there's going to be this quickening event where it, I think instantaneously we'll be caught up and then we'll be with Christ and with the city of Enoch and all the other righteous saints from ages past. But uh, you have to wonder if maybe there's a process to that, too. If maybe they're already starting to visit and we don't know. I'll show you what I mean a little bit later. But Jeffrey R. Holland just said we need to believe in angels. And he takes a scripture from D&C uh, that's talking about essentially joining in association with them. An innumerable, innumerable company of angels. Uh, the Church of Enoch and of the, first, <laughs> me, of the firstborn. So, okay, the next couple times that uh, angels show up in general conference, one is with Elder Rasband, Words Matter, and uh, his talk, 
is just like what it sounds like, that we need to be careful with our words and how we interact with each other. Uh, he says, we are Heavenly Father's children, and he is our God, and he expects us to speak with the tongue of angels by the power of the Holy Ghost. So not talking necessarily about angels having charge over us or anything like that, but we need to be like angels, talk like angels. Uh, then we have President Oaks, Covenants and Responsibilities. He just uh, he uses the word angel, but he uses it in the context of the angel Moroni giving instructions to Joseph Smith. And then we get to Elder um, uh, Anderson's talk. Ever since he was called, I always met like confuse him with Elder Stevenson. To me, they're like the same person. And I always have to like take an extra second to think to separate them out. Okay, Elder Anderson. <laughs> See, I just had to do it again. Interestingly, uh, on his talk, uh, the word angel or angels all together show up seven times. The name of his talk is Temples, Houses of the Lord Dotting the Earth. This is one of the talks where he showed a map, like a temple map. Uh, the other one was actually President Oaks. He showed a temple map, but he showed a, a map for the entire world. So that stuck out to me, but that, that's beside the point. But that's just kind of interesting to note, two temple maps. Okay, so look what he says. And this, this stunned me when he said this. Why is the Lord now bringing hundreds of his temples closer to us? Again, I think I've already said this on the channel. I would have thought, oh, so, you know, some more of us can do the work of salvation, hasten the work, gather scattered Israel on the other side of the veil, uh, prepare for the second coming, on and on and on. Okay. He says, this is the, the reason that he chooses to highlight among other reasons. He says, one reason is that amid the turmoil and temptations of the world, he has promised to strengthen and bless his covenant saints and his promises are being fulfilled. And then the next section is promises from the Kirtland temple. How do these holy houses strengthen, comfort, and protect us? We find an answer in the pleadings of the prophet Joseph Smith in the dedication of the Kirtland Temple. It was in this temple where the saints sang, will sing and will shout with the armies of heaven. Angels. The Savior himself appeared and prophets of old returned, bestowing additional priesthood keys to the restored gospel. On that sacred occasion in the Kirtland Temple, the prophet prayed that in the Lord's that in the Lord's holy house the saints would be armed with the power of God. Pay attention to that phrase. That's going to come up in a second. Armed with the power of God, that the name of Jesus Christ would be upon them, that his angels would have charge over them, and that they would grow up uh, in the Lord. They would grow up in the Lord and receive a fullness of the Holy Ghost. These powerful supplications are fulfilled in our lives as we faithfully worship in the house of the Lord. So this is where we start talking about angels having charge over us. And uh, that actually comes from DNC uh, section 109, the Kirtland Temple dedicatory prayer, verse 22. In fact, I guess I should read that. Uh, and we ask thee, Holy Father, that thy servants may go forth from this house armed with thy power, and that thy name may be upon them. In thy glory be round about them, and thine angels have charge over them. So what I decided to do is uh, look that up. I have this spreadsheet that I haven't visited for a while called Timeline Scriptures, and it's similar to uh, my other spreadsheets where I track words and phrases from General Conference, but this one is just focused on um, Scripture citations. And so I decided to throw on here uh, DNC 109.22. Angels have charge over them. And what's interesting is uh, how many times in recent years this has come up or how many times this has been cited. So we're looking at this column right here, okay? You see this block from 2009 until present. And then you go before that and there's a couple. But then before 1992, you don't see it at all. All the way back to 1942, anyway. So... This scripture being cited in general conference, uh, this frequently is a relatively recent phenomenon from 2009 until present. And this year, uh, there's been two times already just in one general conference. I guess we'll see what happens in October general conference. 
And uh, remember what I was saying about uh, that phrase, being armed with power? Look at this scripture next to it, 1 Nephi 14.14. 14. Uh, this one, I've done videos about this and uh, this phrase, the power of God, or the power of, uh, the power of God in great glory. Uh, anytime that that shows up in the scriptures, it's usually in reference, uh, almost every time except for maybe one or two, it's always in reference to the second coming and preparation for the second coming. So it says, And it came to pass that I, Nephi, beheld the power of the Lamb of God, that it descended upon the saints of the church of the Lamb, and upon the covenant people of the Lord, who were scattered upon all the face of the earth, and they were armed with righteousness and with the power of God in great glory. So without re reviewing that entire video again, uh, it's basically in reference to uh, preparing for the second coming and doing that by going to the temple. Um, and of course, having our armor, you know, that wearing the temple garment, but, but also, you know, receiving the covenants and keeping our covenants, being on the covenant path, all that together. So these are two very similar things. Uh, this one has more reference to like wearing the temple garment and uh, receiving protection in our covenants, you know, uh, being righteous, being a covenant people, going to the temple. And then this one, uh, you know, hones in on angels having charge over us. And you'll see that there's a pretty good uh, overlap here. Like these kind of like both take off at the same time. Um, first Nephi 14, 14, when you go back in time, you see it maybe a little bit more than D DNC 109.22, but they kind of both take off, I guess you could say in 2001, but maybe even more so in 2009. So protection, protection, temporal and spiritual by going to the temple, um, both just protection from the Lord, uh, but also because angels are with you. Uh, the army of, of heaven is with you. Okay, so um, let's go back to this. Okay, uh, now let's move on. Later on in his talk, uh, he has a section called, again, this is Elder Anderson. He has, he has a section called Angels with Us. In the Kirtland Temple, the prophet Joseph prayed that angels would have charge over his saints. Regularly performing ordinances for our ancestors in the temple brings a sweet and sure confirmation that life continues beyond the veil. Although many of our experiences in the house of the Lord are too sacred to share publicly, uh, some we can share. And then he tells the story about how he, just the way that it worked out, he ended up doing all the like ordinances for this guy who had passed away, Eleazar Circe, and how it really seemed like his work needed to be done right then and there and as soon as possible. And he didn't, uh, Elder Anderson didn't plan it out that way. It's just he kept getting that name. And then he says, most of our experiences in the house of the Lord bring joyful peace and quiet revelation more than dramatic intervention. But be assured, angels do have charge over us. So in this case, it's like he's referring to what happened uh, with him doing the work for Elias or Circe, how undoubtedly there were angels that were involved in that. You know, so... Anyway, sometimes like I think we always just think like, oh, it's the spirit, it's the spirit. And it is, right? It is. But there's more. There's also angels involved in a lot of things. And it's not like we have like some disclaimer uh, whenever it's taking place, but they are there. Later on in the talk, he says, my beloved friends, if we are able to have not, all, okay, if we are able and have not already increased our attendance at the temple, let us regularly find more time to worship in the house of the Lord. Let us pray for the temples that have been announced, that properties can be purchased, that governments will approve plans, that talented workers will see their gifts magnified, and that the sacred dedications will uh, bring up the approval of heaven and the visit of angels. It's such an interesting thing to say. Okay, next section, promises. The temple is literally the house of the Lord. I promise you, as you come worthily and prayerfully to his holy house, you will be armed. There it is. Just like uh, 1 Nephi 14, 14, you'll be armed with his power. His name will be upon you. His angels will have charge over you, and you will grow up in the blessing of the Holy Ghost. The Lord promised 
Every soul who forsaketh his sins and cometh unto me and calleth on my name and obeyeth my voice and keepeth my commandments shall see my face and know that I am. There are many different ways to see the face of Christ, and there is no better place than in his holy house. Again, sometimes we we tend to read the scriptures and want things to be very literal, like Christ visiting the new Jerusalem. And maybe there will be some big thing. I don't know. But I tend to think that he is visiting the new Jerusalem right now when we go to the temple. And like Elder Anderson, and Elder Anderson is not the only one who has said this. President Eyring quoted President uh, Nelson, who said that we see the face of the Lord or we see Christ in the temple in the sense that he's no longer unknown to us. And then, of course, for all you know, maybe he has actually been there, whether seen or unseen. You know, just because there's somebody in the temple and they're not wearing robes and don't have a beard, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's not him. I'm going to show you that in just a minute. Uh, that's not based on nothing. Okay. In this day of confusion and commotion, I testify that the temple is his holy house and will help preserve us, protect us, and prepare us for the glorious day when, with all his holy angels, our Savior returns in majesty, power, and great glory. Referring to the second coming, of course. Okay, the next one is, uh, and the last one, is President Nelson himself. Rejoice in the keys, or sorry, rejoice in the gift of priesthood keys. And uh, kind of toward the end of his talk, he says, We are instructed that all who worship in the temple will have the power of God. There it is. But first Nephi 14:14, 14, 14, the power of God and angels having charge over them. And then he cites DNC 109:22. How much does it increase your confidence to know that as endowed as an endowed woman or man armed with the power of God, you do not have to face life alone? And right here, he's not referring to like getting married in the temple or anything like that. He's talking about receiving your endowment in that once you do, uh, you're not alone, which of course you're not alone before because you have the spirit, but you, it's like you have even more once you're endowed and once you go to the temple. And, um, you know, we're talking about angels. This is the same paragraph where he's talking about angels having charge over you uh, when you go to the temple. So you do not have to face life alone. And you have to watch this part in the video. I don't play conference videos on my channel. Um, but you should watch this part of his talk where he he really stresses this part that I have this next highlighted part in yellow. What courage does it give you to know? And here's the part that he, you have to watch his body language and his tone of voice. What courage does it give you to know that angels really will help you? So they're being serious. They're reminding us that angels are there. And I've never like seen a general conference where this was like stressed so much. Like, yes, maybe the word angel and angels have been used more, but the context may have been more like, you know, for example, you can see right here in 2020, both angel and angels, there was like an uptick. Uh, and it's probably because we were commem commemorating the, the first vision and the restoration of the gospel and angels coming after the first vision, the angel Moroni and others uh, to restore things and to give guidance to the prophet Joseph Smith. But as far as like you guys go to the temple, angels will attend you. I don't think I've heard so much of that as I have in this general conference. So let's take note of that. But that's really nice. <laughs> I like that idea. I'm sure that you do too. Um, okay. And then as I, as I was doing more research into this, I was looking up a few things and I came across this phrase, angels unawares. So now we're going to do like a little bit of a shift, um, looking at the practical aspect of how angels would actually appear, like who angels are and how they would actually appear in your life. Okay. So the most recent one, the most recent instance of angels unawares is from Elder Gong in the April 2023 General Conference. 
He says, ward councils, elder cor- elders quorums, and relief societies, please hearken to the good shepherd and help him seek that which was lost, bring again that which was driven away, bind up that which was broken, strengthen that which was sick. We may entertain angels unawares, and that's from Hebrews 13.2 which says, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. And then he says, uh, As we make room in his inn for all. So that's kind of scary and kind of a a warning. Uh, The way that we look at others and treat others, you never know who you're... Not that like... You should treat them any differently because you know that they're an angel, like an actual angel, somebody that's like passed on or something like that. But um, you never know what they're going to do in their life. And regardless, they're a beloved son or daughter of God. But sometimes we can like dehumanize people and not really think about their their true worth um, to our Heavenly Father. And, you know, we just kind of treat them as a stranger. But anyway, you never know who, who you're actually interacting with or what their future may be. If they're still in mortality, what their future may be. You may be, you know, helping somebody that's the future president of the church or future relief society president of the church or something like that. The, the, you know, so there's that. Let me go to the next one. This is, um, the October, 1969 general conference, uh, Elder Sterling W. Sill, assistant to the Council of the Twelve. That's a position that doesn't like exist anymore. It's not, or it's not called that. All right, he says it is helpful for us to remember uh, that God, angels, spirits, and men are all of the same species, in different stages of development, in various degrees of righteousness. So, let me pause here. That's a big difference between our church and other Christian churches or between us and Jews. Whenever I talk to Rabbi Gerfine and we talk about angels, he is essentially talking about like an alien race of beings that uh, serve God, but they're like not human in any sort of way. That when they appear, they appear human, but that's because they change their true form. That in reality, you have angels that are like miles long. You have some that look like wheels. You have some that exist for just a nanosecond and that they're basically programs that God uses to carry out his purposes. That's like the Jewish view. Um, for us, it's it's no. It, we're all the same species and angels are either um, someone who hasn't been born yet. They're, they're like appearing pre-mortally, like Christ has done that before. Uh, like when he appeared at Adam on Diamond, uh, when Adam had the, that first grand council of Adam on Diamond. So you have people that can appear uh, pre-mortally. You have those uh, that may be in the spirit world, but they appear. You may have some that um, are now resurrected, uh, as is the case with uh, the angel Moroni. He's resurrected and he's appeared and uh, Moses and Elijah and, and people like that. So... Anyway, all the same species. We are the same species as God. That's a big difference between us and other um, denominations. Okay. And the Apostle Paul says that we should not be forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. But who are these with whom we worship? King David a- <coughs> Excuse me. King David asks a helpful question where he exclaims, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy, thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. Psalms 8, verses 4 through 6. One Bible trans- translation says, Thou hast made him for a little while. Okay. Thou hast made him for a little while lower than the angels. In some ways, even Jesus was made lower than the angels temporarily. And what a thrill it ought to be for us each week to properly honor God and allow in our fellow human beings as 
Uh, he, okay. To properly honor God and our fellow human beings as he has directed. And we are sure that someday when we come to stand before God, we will find that those who have, who have effectively kept his commandments will be, um, will be different kind of people than those who have ignored or disobeyed him. So I'll, I'll end right there. So yeah, because we're all going to have different resurrected bodies according to uh, what kingdom you inherit. So interesting stuff. We need to remember um, our doctrine as to who angels are. They're not these like creatures, um, this other type of species or whatever. Um, they're, they're us. We're them. They are us. Different stages of mortality or different stages of progression. The next one is Orson Hyde from Journal of Discourses, volume 17, uh, page 354, column B. For some time past, the Indians or the Native Americans have been telling us very strange stories. They say that certain strange men have visited them and spoken to them and have taught them what to do in order to be saved in the kingdom of God. Strange men have come to and talked with them, perhaps an hour at a time, and while the Indians are looking at them, they vanish out of sight, and they know not where to go. Uh, I do not know that it is so, but this is what the Indians declare and testify to, and I'm a little inclined to believe that there is something in it. For you know the Apostle Paul, in speaking to his brethren, said, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Perhaps one of these old men might come along in disguise, incognito, not in his real character, and appear like any other man, clad as any other man, and stay overnight with some of the brethren. Now, I have done a number of videos about Native Americans uh, in stories that seem to be the three Nephites visiting with them. I used to have it, have it as a playlist, but... If you do a search on my channel for three Nephites, you'll find it. I've done a bunch. I should probably make this a playlist again. Dang it. Okay, whatever. So if you're interested in that, you should read these because there are some pretty stunning accounts. Uh, not just for, for Native Americans, but also uh, just early people. Uh, you know, the, the early part of American history and having in encounters with... Uh, prophets and strange men that just like show up and teach them spiritual things. So there's that. Okay. Now we're with Orson Pratt, Journal of Discourses, volume 16, page 212. What greater testimony concerning the ministering of angels has any person ever, ever given to human, given to the human family than the one I have named. And he's talking about, uh, visitations to the prophet Joseph Smith. And then he says, we read about angels ministering in ancient times on various occasions and for certain purposes, sometimes appearing in great glory and sometimes withholding their glory. Hence, it is it is written by one of the apostles, be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for some in so doing have entertained angels unawares, showing that angels have sometimes withheld their glory and appeared like common men in that they uh, have been entertained as such. In other instances, their glory was exhibited uh, before those who they revealed themselves, and they bore testimony to the things they heard from the mouths of, of their divine visitants. Okay, just a few more. There's a few more pretty interesting things. This is Heber C. Kimball. Um, no, you know what? I'm going to skip this one. This video is going a little bit long. Okay, Brigham Young, Journal of Discourses, Volume 6, uh, page starting on page 295A. You will, in, okay, he's talking about like, he's talking about the millennium. Okay, th that's the context of this. You will enter into the temple of the Lord and begin to offer up ordinances before the Lord for your dead. Uh, says this or that man, I want to have such a person. I want to save my father. And he straightway goes forth in the ordinance of baptism and is confirmed and washed and anointed and ordained to be or to the blessings of the holy priesthood for his ancestors. Before this work is finished, a great many of the elders of Israel in Mount Zion will become like pillars in the temple of God to go no more out. They will eat and drink and sleep there. And they will often have occasion to say, Somebody came into the temple last night. We do not know who he was, but he was no doubt a brother, 
and told us a great many things we did not before understand. He gave us the names of a great many of our forefathers that are not on record, and he gave me my true lineage and the names of my forefathers for hundreds of years back. He said to me, you and I are connected in one family. Uh, There are the names of your ancestors. Take them and write them down and be baptized and confirmed and save such and such ones and receive of the blessings of the eternal priesthood for such and such an individual as you do for yourselves. This is what we are going to do for the inhabitants of the earth. When I look at it, I do not want to rest a great deal, but be industrious all the day long. For when we come to think upon it, we have no time to lose, for it is a pretty laborious work. I have a great <coughs> excuse me, I have a great feeling to just let the lash slide over onto some men a little. Do you think uh, they would want to go to California to get gold or run to the fairies whence the name of the Almighty is blasphemed if they properly understood these things, the way of life and salvation? Now listen to this. You will enter into the temple of the Lord. When by and by, here come along brothers Joseph and Hiram Smith, for instance, for they will be perfectly capable of coming and staying overnight with you, and you not know who they are. Or suppose David Patton should come along and shake hands with some of the twelve and want to stay all night with them and expound the scriptures and reveal the hidden things of God. It will not be long before this will be so. So, I mean, who know who knows you guys who you've met in your life? And they may just look like regular people. Like you look at their clothes and it's like, Joseph Smith wouldn't wear that shirt or he wouldn't, you know, look, he has like a wallet. Uh, what do, does he need a wallet in the spirit world? Um, you don't know. You don't know. They, they, it's like they come in disguise. They can, uh, according to whatever the purpose is. Because if it was really obvious, then it would defeat the purpose of whatever they're trying to uh, do or communicate to you. You know, there's obviously a reason why sometimes they have to come incognito. So if they're going to do it, they better do a good job at it and have a wallet, maybe a driver's license. But then it's just like a fictitious driver's license. (laughs) Um, Okay, just a few more. This is Brigham Young. Journal of Discourses, volume 19, uh, page 264, column B, speaking of Jesus Christ. Uh, If he were here today, as he appeared at Jerusalem, he would pass through the congregation and no one would suppose but what he was an ordinary stranger visiting us. And then he says more. Now, these ones that I just shared with you, I'm going to have to put them on my spreadsheets, but I already have this one right here on my spreadsheet. Brigham Young. Uh, this is from the Millennial Star, an article called Discourse by uh, President Brigham Young. September 1854, page 593. In speaking of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ as a thief in the night, or like the light of the morning, so that all flesh uh, see his glory together, and many more like expressions, combined them all in one, and it creates confusion in the mind. Again, if we suppose the Savior is coming once for all, and that at his first appearance upon the earth, he will destroy all the wicked and cleanse the earth from its blood and corruption, it would conflict with many other sayings in the Holy Scriptures. I think the great portion of his people have excellent ideas, and a great many of them have correct ideas with regard to the coming of the Son of Man. In the first place, allow me to remark that Jesus is at liberty. He has the power ability, and the right, whenever he esteems it necessary, to reveal himself to an individual or to a community. He will manifest himself to the congregation while while in their public worship. So can you imagine that? Like if he showed up, and pause, if he like showed up um, in your sacrament meeting, in your sacrament meeting or stake conference or, you know, at the temple. And I'm sure that he has. And how would we know? Because whoever was there would be given, I'm sure, be given a strict commandment not to reveal it. So who knows how much this is, how often this has happened. And if it hasn't happened to you, don't get upset about it. Um, it hasn't happened to me that I know of. If it has, my memory has been, aw- been erased. Don't be upset. Don't be jealous. But I'm just saying, it, 
I'm sure that this kind of thing has already happened, and who knows how many times. Okay, continuing. In short, he comes when he pleases and returns when he pleases. The very nature of the character of the Savior, as we understand his character, gives him the prerogative of, of appearing to an individual at noonday, at midnight, in the morning, or in the evening, where, when, and as he pleases. Uh, this is his undoubted right. Now, the last one, I just barely found this today. Uh, I I can't believe that he said this as well. This is also Brigham Young, volume, uh, Journal of Discourses, volume 11, page, uh, starting on page 40, um, column B. I will, nace, I, oh my gosh. I will now say a few words relating to the sub, subject which was presented to the people this morning. Inquiries were made by the speaker, uh, why we have not seen God, why we are subject to sin, why, why we are, are in this fallen world. I will briefly answer these queries. If our Father and God should be disposed to walk through one of these aisles. So now he's talking about God the Father should be disposed to walk through one of these aisles. We should not know him from one of the congregation. Now, my goodness, could you imagine uh, if you have come across somebody and it was actually God the Father and you weren't very nice to him? Continuing, uh, you would see a man and that is all you would know about him. You would merely know him as a stranger from some neighboring city or country. This is the character of him whom we worship and acknowledge as our Father and God when he is disposed to visit a house, a neighborhood, or a congregation. He does it at his pleasure, and although he may be seen by mortals in this character, yet no man can see him in his glory and live. Remember what Orson Pratt said a little while ago? He said that um, angels can like withhold their glory. And, I, and that makes sense, right? Um, it makes sense because you have like stories of Jesus Christ appearing in the Salt Lake Temple to Lorenzo Snow. I, I don't know if like everyone was out of the temple at that point, but if there was anybody in there, they would either have to be translated or Christ would have to be like withholding his glory. Otherwise, they would be consumed. So it's like they can, you know, turn it off and on, basically. So uh, when the Lord sends an angel to visit men, he gives him power and authority to appear to the people as a man and not as an angel in his glory. Uh, for we could not endure the, the presence of an angel in his glory. No mortal man has ever seen God in his glory at any time and lived. We may have seen the Lord and angels many times, and did not know it. I'll be satisfied with seeing and associating with his children, whom I now behold, for there is not a son or daughter of Adam and Eve before me today that is uh, but what is the but what is the offspring of that God we worship? So you know, when you have prophets and apostles saying this, uh, both back during this period or whether it's more recently uh you know talking well they're not talking about angels appearing to you um it, well no elder gong kind of did but whatever the case if you have president if you have prophets and apostles saying these things you know they're kind of giving you a hint don't be surprised if after this life when you like review your life, you have a, a, a bright recollection of your life and everything that happened. Don't be surprised if it's later revealed. Oh yeah. You know, that guy that was at the bus stop, or do you remember when you were in the airport or you remember that person that came and visited uh, your ward that one time? Don't be surprised if some of those people actually end up being an angel, a prophet, a family member, Christ or God, the father himself. So there is another world. It's not just what we see here. And too many of us live as though this is all that there is, like what we see with our senses. And, you know, there's no, there's no, like we see through it all. You know, there's nothing that's withheld from us. And, and that's not true. So 
go to the temple and treat everybody kindly and then uh, try and act like an angel. Okay, that's going to be it for this one. If you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe, like this video if you liked it, leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. Also, make sure to share it, and I'll talk to you guys later.